Well, welcome back to The Morning Toast. I am so excited about today's guest, and I'm going to intro. We are sitting down with the iconic author of Luckiest Girl Alive, Jessica Knoll is here. You're also like a movie producer now. I don't even know how to how to properly introduce you. I know. I wear several hats. Um, I'm an executive producer. Oh. I'm a screenwriter, novelist. Sometimes I write essays for a little... <laughs> known place the new york times mm. you know find me anywhere Maybe. honestly <laughs> i wanted to introduce you before we got in i have to tell you that so up until the end of 2020 i had not read a full book perhaps ever in my life <laughs> like i just did not like reading and i did really judge other people who read for fun i'm like oh my god get a life um and then we went on vacation or like are brought... you are you lying like like i don't know no. if i believe you you know no 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 no, oh, no. Yeah. no not lying like and i don't think she ever did the school reading i really no. can't maybe back in the day you read like no, gossip I'm, girl i'm saying i'm saying like when people <laughs> say i read for fun like were you kind of like yeah you're lying i don't oh, believe you yeah i'm sure you do read for fun <laughs> have yeah, you ever exactly. had alcohol <laughs> like i was just i was a hater i was a big time <laughs> hater and December of 2020, we went on vacation. Jackie brought a hard copy of Luckiest Girl Alive and she finished it and she was like, she had been trying to get me to read. And she was like, Claudia, just read this one book and just read and just trust me. And I was like, okay, you know what? What else am I doing? We were in the mountains. I read the entire book. And since then I've read over a hundred books. Like I'm obsessed oh with reading God. now. It, it all started with Luckiest Girl Alive and I'm not even lying. No lie. Oh my God, that's actually incredible. My book was like a gateway drug to reading. Yes, like that, <laughs> it was a I, gateway no drug. One's ever told me that, no one's ever told me that before. That makes me really, really happy. I figured that you should know, like the work you do is so important. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> So you are the author, of course, of Luckiest Girl Alive, which just got made into a movie on Netflix, which we're going to talk about because yeah. that's so major. Um, but I feel like before that, you were having this unprecedented success with your book. I mean, we're obsessed with it. Um, can you talk a little bit about like what the process was like from just, you know, a girl with a book to then like a best selling on every list? What was that like? Yeah, um, that part of it, once it once the book was out in the world like that part of it happened like in a pretty contained space like about a year um writing the book i for years like i'd been a magazine editor so i, I was writing this book while i was uh working at cosmopolitan so i would wake up in the morning before work get like an hour to an hour and a half of writing done and then i would go into the office and i wrote my book in like under a year uh doing it that wow. way and um my and you know i had been fortunate enough that in my very first job out of college i had briefly and disastrously worked as an assistant to an agent at the paradigm agency but what ended oh. up happening is i i met another assistant there who who was like this is actually what i want to do be a literary agent so i left to work in magazines and to write and she stayed on and at the time she was promoted to like a junior agent like we were like probably like 27 she emailed me and was like you're writing so much for cosmo like i know you have a book in you like you should write a book and then like i'll sell it and like you know she needed clients like the, you know mm -hmm. she had like just been kind of anointed as a junior agent and um she also happened to be from the same area i'm from outside of philadelphia we didn't know each other in high school but like we were only a year apart in age like it just she got the kind of Malou of that area which is like super specific so it was also really great to like work with her for that reason and then yeah she was able to sell it you know I had that connection I think working in magazines at the time it was like I mean still I think like publishers love like magazine editors because you tend to just be like you know know a lot of people who could potentially support the book and help sell the book um so I started writing the book in 2013 it published in 2015 and yeah all the success came you know pretty quickly that year of 2015 it was the best-selling debut uh that year yeah so no really and that's like of. not normal <laughs> like your first book yeah. gets made into a Netflix mm -hmm. movie like that's not normal mm -hmm. no it's not normal and like it almost didn't happen a lot of time like many times like, right it took, I mean that was 2015 this book came out and we're sitting here in the fall of 2022 and yeah. you know with the movie on the horizon so um yeah it took 
I've been with this story for almost 10 years, which is crazy. Wow. Wow. I feel like so yeah. many of the books that we love that we hear are going to be turned into movies or shows actually don't wind up making it all the way. Yeah. So the fact that the movie is here now, Claudia and I got to watch a sneak. We got a preview of I it saw um, your early. Instagram. We got screeners. Uh, which yeah. was one of the highlights <laughs> of our year for sure. We really don't get screeners for anything, oh. and if it was going to be anything, our favorite book will do. That's amazing. Um, so, what was the process of making this into a movie? And I have to imagine, anytime I read a book, I cast the movie in my head. It's like a fun way to use my brain. Totally. And I have to imagine when yeah. you were writing it, and even when it was going into movie production, that you had someone in your head. Was it always Mila Kunis, and how did she come to the role eventually? So at the time that I was writing the book, I really, truly could not see past, like, I just want this to be, like, published as a book, and I want it to, like, do really well. Um, once the conversation started happening around optioning it for a film, like, that's when I was like, oh, you know, starting to think like that. The thing that's so, that I've just learned over the last seven years, and not just working on this adaptation, like I, you know, my second book I'm working on adapting into a TV show, like I've written original screenplays, I've adapted other people's books into screenplays now. And so it's, it's like I'm taint, like I'm tainted by like the studio, like suits, you know, because like there's mm -hmm. this idea of like, this is a bankable star, you know, people want to watch this person, like the studio will sign off on this person, then you have to also you know, have producer approval, director approval. Like, they're so, it's so rare that, like, in who you picture in your head and what you want um, is ever going to work out for whatever reason that, like, I feel like I don't even, I don't even dream anymore. <laughs> right. <laughs> because I'm just so, like, I just have so, I, I just, in my head, I'm, like, so practical about it now. And so the Mila of it, was really interesting because we had been set up at Lion at the Lionsgate studio for years and they were really interested in it initially and then it they just couldn't get it off the ground and they would only make it with like two actresses and we were like we're never gonna get them because they're like crazy busy and booked up for years and they're like well no one's gonna like want to come to a theater to like see like you know, all this, you know, sensitive material, which is always so weird to me because I'm like, but there's like humor and irreverence in this. And like, it's also yes. just like a really com compelling, intriguing story. So like they were just hyper focused on the more traumatic elements of the book. Um, so when we got to Netflix, it was 2019 and Scott Stuber, who is the head of the film department there was like, the first person we want you to go out to is Mila Kunis. And my reaction was actually, I was annoyed because the whole point of going to Netflix was that we would have flexibility in terms of the star we could go out to. And we had just, I had just been on this hamster wheel for years of going out to big name stars and having, having them say no. Like they're like, this is just too, like, it's just too tricky. I'm just too scared to kind of touch it. And I was like, we're just wasting time. Like. I thought if we came to Netflix, like, we would just be able to, like, we would have, like, a longer list of names we could go out to. Like, they wouldn't have to be these big megawatt stars. And I was like, she's just going to take forever to read, and then she's just going to say no, and then we're going to lose momentum. And, like, this is exactly what happened at Lionsgate. And so I was, like, really, really annoyed. And then she read it and was like, I'm into this, guys. Like, let's talk. And so I had to eat my words because it like ended <laughs> up being the best thing ever. <laughs> no, and she was amazing. We've seen the movie. She was incredible. I have to imagine, um, like, any book to an author is deeply personal. But I read in your acknowledgments that, you know, there were parts of Tiffany's story that were true to you. So I imagine, like, handing that over to a Lionsgate or Netflix can be quite... Um, uncomfortable honestly because it's your story being told by someone else through someone else's eyes so you said they, that you were an executive producer is that right yeah that's right so you were able to control it a little bit more yeah I mean I think it was the fact that I was also the writer it's I think that executive producer is almost a little bit of a vanity title for some people mm -hmm. some people it's not some people you're actually doing the executive producer work um and sometimes if you're the author of the IP of the original material, but you're not involved in the adaptation, they'll give you 
producer, maybe not executive, but like, or maybe they do. I don't, I don't, I shouldn't actually speak on this. Like I know, but normally you get some sort of producerial credit. Um, and, and yes, like consulting, like they'll show you drafts, but like, if you don't like something, mm-hmm. they're not going to like change it. Being yeah. like, that was partly why I was like, I have to be the one to adapt this myself, even though I've never written a screenplay before because I the idea of not being involved every step of the way and like knowing what was going on like it just would have made me bananas crazy like I'm crazy. just such a control freak um so it was like that as much a at the time that that the story was being handed over I hadn't really been vocal about the fact that there was a lot of me and my own experience in this character so I think it was also me trying to be super protective of like my my own self and my own story um so I was like no I need to be like involved in everything yeah yeah so when you adapt a um a book into a movie overall like when was the first day on set the first day on set was June something of 2021 so we had post-production yeah so we had post-production it was about a uh, four months overall, which includes post, or sorry, no, I'm saying post, includes pre-production. So that pre-production is about like a month. So you're not filming for that whole time. Um, and you get weekends off or like whatever, our weekends happen to be Saturday and Sunday, but sometimes your weekends are like Monday and Tuesday. It just depends mm. what your film schedule is. Um, so yeah, it was like a Monday sometime in June. I'm sure I can get the exact date. Um, and we started with all the flashbacks. So Mila actually wasn't even oh. in on set at that point. It was just all the, I call them kids, but they're between, they're all over 18. Um, right. but all the kids in the flat, they're kids to me. <laughs> yeah. Like, and the actress use. who played young Mila was incredible. Tiara. She's so Oh my God. Good, amazing. Right? She's so incredible. Good. And as like a human being, she's just like an incredible person too. So how do you decide? Because like the book was, it was a pretty long book. How do you decide what makes the yeah. cut for a film and what doesn't? Like how do you decide what is integral to the storyline? Yeah, it's interesting because it's like there are things that we've taken out, put back in, that we've added that aren't in the book. Like it was con- it was like a constantly evolving kind of document. Like... I probably wrote close to 60 drafts of that script over the years. Um, And, and it's, you know, you always hear people say that like film is much more collaborative than a book and it truly is. And you, with a book, like it's really just kind of you and your editor and it's very hands off in a lot of ways. Um, In a movie, there's so much more money at stake. And so you have so many more people who have to weigh in and give their opinion from all the producers to your director to your executives at whatever your studio is. So a lot of times there would even be like conflict or, you know, some people feeling like I want this or I want to lose this. Um, So I just did my best to like, I, you know, I fought for what I really wanted. I, I seeded some battles. Um, because I'm like, maybe I wouldn't have made that choice as like a storyteller, but this person who knows this medium and has been doing this for years and years and years is telling me this is the right decision and giving me a really good argument as to why. So I'm going to, and I, I trust everyone I'm working with. So I'm going to trust them that this is the right decision. And like, there was an example in particular where I fought really hard for something. And in the end, our director was like, I'm going to take this out and I want you to see a cut of the film without these two scenes in it. And he showed it to me and I was like, damn it. Yeah. Right. (laughs) You know? Yeah. I love the movie because I think it's so similar to the book. I feel like that really doesn't happen so often. There are always so many changes or storylines that have to be left out. And I feel like aside from like a few things, it's really how I envision the book. Even the people, Mila Kunis, like she's Ani through and through. Luke Luke was perfectly cast. Luke was perfectly cast. Finn is so good. He's so good. Also, the settings were so wonderful. And I feel like the production value, even the fact that it was based in New York, I feel like so much stuff that's based in New York isn't actually filmed here. But these are city streets, city scenes. And it really... They filmed outside our building, remember? Yeah, they did. When we first saw those pictures of Mila and... um, Luke, Luke walking down the street Finn, uh, yeah like that was the most on exciting fifth? thing on that's, yeah. Building? Yeah. that's so crazy 
Yeah, yeah. we were dying. We were so excited um, and it really felt like the book come to life. So I imagine you must be, you must love the movie, yeah? Right. <laughs> yes, I love it. I mean, I've seen it, oh my God, I've seen it so many times and I've seen it through so many iterations, you know, like the first cut was really, really rough and I, you know, this is my first rodeo with, you know, being involved in like, I've been in the develop pro process for a lot of things, but I've never gotten to production. I've never gotten to post. I had no idea post was going to be as much work as it was, which we were based out of New York for that. I was back and forth. I live in LA now, but I was like back and forth to New York a lot over the winter. Um, and I couldn't believe how much writing and rewriting I was doing because they're recording stuff in ADR sessions and kind of like slipping it in, like all that movie magic. Um, but yes, it was absolutely... The, it was beautifully lit, which is like, and all the actors who were on set were like, this is, so the, I have to give credit to our uh, DP, Colin Watkinson, for that, because like, he did all of that lighting and all of those camera angles and like worked with our director very closely to like, pull that off and the, the color palette and all of that. And like, some of the extras would even come off set and be like, this is the most like beautifully lit production I've ever been on. And I was like, wow, oh my God, that's amazing. You know, so like I learned all these things that are like important to people in front of the camera that like as someone behind the camera, like I never would have even thought of on my Noticed. own. So yeah, it was a very like educational experience for me too. Yeah, it was stunning. I particularly love the Nantucket scenes, that home, that country home. I just, I need one of those. Yes, I need one of those too. <laughs> um, can I ask you a question like from the book? Because am I toxic? Because I like would have taken a bullet for Ani and Mr. Larson. Like they needed to get together. And I think there's like a group of us who like ship them so hard. Um, and like what about yeah. an alternate ending where they end up together? They end up together. Well, it's so funny because like agree like a hard degree. Yeah, okay, good. Um, okay. And <laughs> like that's why I wrote that. Um yeah. Yeah, I I it's so funny because when I was writing the book, I got to the point where like they were back on the main line for filming of the documentary and they had done everything and they were like, you know, getting really close cuz they're like having these really intimate conversations and then I was like, okay, now they're going to have sex. And so I like would sit down and I would try and write them having sex. And I couldn't. Like, everything I mm. wrote felt so wooden. And yeah. I finally literally. turned to my... <laughs> literally. Oh, my God. <laughs> I walked right into that one. <laughs> no one to blame but myself. Um, I consulted my, my, my agent, Alyssa, and I was like, I can't write the scene. And she was like, what if they don't actually sleep together? Like, what if it's just a kiss? And then when I went in to write the chapter with that in mind, it just like flowed so easily. Yeah. And so there was something about it where like, and Alyssa was always saying, she was like, look, for some people, she's going to be such a tough pill to swallow the character herself that you don't want to like add to that. You don't want to add another barrier to, for, for some people, some people are like, look, I get that she's a bitch. I get it. I'm on board, you know? And, like, that's how I am. Like, she just doesn't bug me. But there, are, you want a lot yeah. of people to read it. So it's like, how many readers are you going to potentially lose? Because you're like, okay, I don't like all these other things she's said and done. And now she's, you know, screwing a married man. Um, right. So I think it was better all around in the end that they don't sleep together and it's always a little hotter when there's like that tension right it's like yes the, and he was you know at one point her teacher so like even yeah. though he was a really young hot cool teacher Aww. I guess it probably was for the best but I just wanted you to know like there is a community of us who ship hard yeah I get it and it's like it's that you know I, I was actually talking to one of our producers on the movie and like we were just saying like you know, we need to, like, work on, like, an erotic thriller together. Like, I need to write something. I'll she read it. Produce it. Because it's, like, yeah, it's just, like, right? Like, it's just when it, things are wrong, they feel so right, you know? Like, it's, like, what is, what is that? Like, it's all, anything, give me anything toxic. Like, I'm just, like, shows me how far I have to go in therapy because I'm, like, I'm, I'm into it. Hundred <laughs> percent. I will be first in line to read that. <laughs> so movie is out. People are loving it. You're kind of like the toast of the literary world. The toast. Oh. Um, 
And you just came right before this from doing the Kelly Clarkson show. And we are yes. head over heels obsessed with Kelly Clarkson. Like, please tell us about her. She So everyone told me they were like, Kelly is legitimately like the coolest, most down to earth person like you'll ever meet. Um, and I tr- the people who were telling me this, like I trusted them because there are also people who have like warned me in advance of like, this person may not be exactly what you're expecting. Um, mm-hmm. So I've had those encounters too. So when these people are telling me she's actually really amazing, I was like, I know she will be. She is. She's not intimidating at all. She's so easy to talk to. Um, she's just like a girl you want to like go get like margaritas with. Like she's really, really cool. A dream. Um, margaritas with Kelly. A dream. A, I mean, can you imagine a better date? Um, no. So yeah, I had a, and they sent us home with these amazing gift bags that had this bo- has a bottle of red and then these specialty chips that they're like the only chip that is made to be had with wine. I never heard of this before. Huh. And there's one Maybe Kelly one. One is manchego flavored and one is smoked gouda. And I'm like, this is this is the best gift bag anyone has ever sent me home with. Um, Kelly so really is so classy. She's so, She's so classy. classy. She's so classy. Yeah. So tell <laughs> us, we're going to be like first people in line for your next book. Can you give like the peeps a little update on that? Because I follow you on Instagram. Totally. And it's been a journey. It's been a journey. It's been a journey. Oh, my God. So my next book is... Uh, we don't have an exact publication date, but it's going to be summer 2023. And um, it is a, it's fiction, but it is based on a real life crime. I, w- I feel like I should just say it. Like, this will be like the first time I'm like talking about it publicly, but I think I should just say it. Like, when else am I going to get the opportunity? Um, so, uh, Ted Bundy, who I'm sure you guys know who Ted Bundy is. Okay. Um mm-hmm. So Ted Bunny is a notorious serial killer who operated in the 1970s. And for I, I always knew who he was, like, you know, by name. I, I knew he was, like, the Seattle killer, and he was, like, handsome and smart and, like, charismatic and all these things. And a couple years ago, there was a new documentary that was out about him. And I just noticed this conversation happening on Twitter Um, that was like, why are we getting, like, another documentary about him? Like, don't we already know everything there is to know about him? Like, what about, like, the, you know, he's, he, you know, murdered over 35 million. I mean, in in some, in some estimates, like, it could be as many as 100 women. And um, they were like, we don't know anything about these women. So I, I thought that was interesting. And I started just, like, doing a little research. I was like, I wonder if there's anything there. And I just found a whole whole new angle of this story that I was like I've not seen this covered anywhere like I did not know that his his final spree happened in Florida where he entered the sorority house at Florida State University and attacked four girls in 15 minutes left two of them dead Mm -hmm. and that the surviving women and the women who lived in the sorority had to go on to be deposed by him because he was acting pro se as his own attorney. This was like legal. They had to be like, they had to like face him down. And these are women like in their early 60s, like this didn't happen like that, that long ago, you know? And the way they were treated and kind of mistreated and there was so much sexism and so much misinformation about how brilliant he was, he was not, I was amazed. He was like a law school dropout. Like right. he had terrible LSTAT scores. Like all this stuff, the way he was m- like memorialized and remembered, it's so not true. And these women were actually really the exceptional ones. So it's a kind of a fictional retelling um, from the perspective of one of the sorority girls who's a, not a real person, but like just inspired in general by like some of these women I read about. And then also from a woman who ultimately becomes his victim back in Seattle. And there's kind of like a character that goes between these two um, storylines and is kind of helping bring him to justice. And there's also a lot of mystery around some of the crimes still in Seattle, um, like answers that, you know, so I, I kind of imagine what some of these answers are that people never get. So there's still like, a, you know, you're kind of pulling at a thread right. to figure out 
what what happened um so it's and it's 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 a cool you know it's florida that part of florida is really cool and like a gothic part of florida i don't like do you guys know florida very well because i <laughs> i just moved here you're like laugh. <laughs> no, oh my god wait you live in florida yeah, she just moved Stop. Here like two months ago the panhandle which is like the northern part of florida it's very old gothic south like it's almost like you're in like not like I, the saying about florida which i think is so interesting is the further south you go the more north you get and then the more north you go hmm. the further south you get because north is like miami and it's like super cosmopolitan mm -hmm. And then when you're up in kind of northern panhandle area, it's really that like old, old southern, um, like gorgeous oak trees and all of that. So I also had, um, it was very intriguing to me to like learn about this area and like do research there and all of that. It was like a great setting, um, like very rich setting for my next book. Um, so oh, we love yeah, a rich so. setting. We do. A rich uh, And I love the people. <laughs> Are you able to call him Ted Bundy in the book, or do you have to no, come so up with more fiction? No, so that's the other partner? thing. Well, I did it on my own because what I what I read was when I, I pulled all the archives from, um, the, uh, I pulled all the transcripts from the Florida archives of the depositions of the, you know, the trial transcripts. And what I found so fucking awesome was that he is recorded in the records as the defendant. And all he ever wanted to be known as was a lawyer, an attorney. Like, mm -hmm. he never completed law school. Like, he couldn't. He wasn't a good law student. He wasn't smart. Um, he was just given the benefit of the doubt because he was, like, kind of a normal-looking guy. Um, right. And all these women who raised the alarm about him, like, were just not really believed. And... Um, so he's he is in these transcripts he's acting as the attorney but he's not given a name he's just called the defendant because that's actually what he is so i refer to him in my book as the defendant got it oh, well i love like he that get a name. perspective on the the reason for this new book because jack and i were just having this conversation on the podcast last week where like as a culture we've gotten to this extremely bizarre place where we like romanticize these male serial killers and we make a million tv shows about them and in every show they're yeah. hotter and cooler and more suave than the next and it's like you're not really getting a nuanced pov about like the actual yeah. horrendous acts of crime that these people committed yeah. and they're almost like becoming celebrities in a weird way yes again well, that's what happened Again. to him. He was like, yeah. And also that like the victims are just lost in this telling. Like, who are they? Yeah. Like, what, like, I think just like humanizing them and not always showing like the violence. They're only shown to, sh to show that there were like the violence that's shown against them. But, like, right. These were women that had like big dreams, big goals. Like some of them went on to do amazing things with their lives. Others were like, right at that like that most exciting period in your life like just you know a lot of them were college students you know yeah. and like about to take their final exams and like they had big plans and they were like really cool. like some of these girls I was like reading about and I interviewed some of the sorority girls and I'm like these were like cool fun girls you know and like history has just completely forgotten about them and swept them aside yeah. and like they're just like the victims you know um so, so true I just yeah so I think I just think this is like a, just a different, it's a reimagining and it's just from a point of view of a, it's, I keep calling it, it's everything you don't know about the story that you think you do. Cause I really thought mm -hmm. I knew this story. And then I did my research right. and I was like, this is even crazier than I ever imagined. And like, I'm so intrigued and com like all of this is so compelling to me. Like I have to find a way to like make this into a book. So that's number three, baby. That, that sounds very so good. Um, thank you so much for being here. Like, this has truly been an honor. I don't think we've ever had an author, except for me. Except but, for you. Ooh. Yeah, of course, of course. <laughs> um, but thank you so much for being here. And thank you for the work that you've done. Because honestly, I actually, the two of you, this is a thank you to Jackie and to Jessica. Because Jackie finally got me hooked on reading. And it was, you were the vehicle, your book. Um, so it's oh really been an gosh. honor to talk to you. Congrats on all the success with the movie and the book. I mean, Thank it's not shocking. You. You're so talented. And it's really been an honor to have you on the show, for real. Thank you so much. Thank you. This has been so much fun. Thank you for having me. 
You're so welcome. And everyone, go check out Luckiest Girl Live on Netflix. But yes. I would recommend reading the book first. I think you should do mm-hmm. both. That's a, always a favorite activity, and you can compare and contrast. So 100%. you're here. <laughs> See you on the next one. Bye. Bye.